Hi, good afternoon. Welcome to our speaker series, the Northampton Neighbors. Um, a quick overview, Northampton Neighbors is an aging in place community centered in Northampton. Um, who knew that? Um, we are a nonprofit organization since 2017, coordinating access to support services and social programs, which assist our generation. Um, programs, um, we want, who want, we, we're doing this because we want to live independently and engage in living um, our own lives within our own homes. Um, today, it's, um, I'm going to tell you a little bit about the logistics of this. Um, we are right now, um, I'm going to get my other paper here. Um, okay, our speaker, Claire Higgins, will speak for, will present for about 25 to 35 minutes. Um, there will be questions following her presentation, uh, and you can use the chat button at the bottom of your screen to put down the, the questions, and I will, I will ask them accordingly as they were presented. And um, there is also in the upper right-hand screen has a box. It's Otter Live Notes, and this is where there's transcriptions and captions if you need that type of assistance. Um, so right now, it's with my pleasure that I'm going to be introducing Claire Higgins. Um, and Claire will be sharing her thoughts and professional wisdom um, by addressing this important topic, family in the time of COVID. Now, Claire and I go back a few years. <laughs> like, I'm not even going to say how long. Um, but she is my mentor, she is my, um, my friend, has been my colleague for, uh, again, I'm not going to say the number of years. This is a little bit about this incredible person that will be presenting today. Um, former Mayor Claire Higgins um, is the executive director of, of the Community Action Pioneer Valley. The federal, it's a federally designated anti-poverty agency serving more than 30,000 of our neighbors in Franklin, Hampshire, Western Hamden, and North Quabbin regions. So do you have enough to do, Claire? Okay. Um, Claire was an educator who worked with children from birth to five years old um, for many, many years. And I basically started knowing her about that time. Um, she was the Young Parent Child Care Director of Sojourn Incorporated before becoming a Center Director and the Program Director of Hampshire Community Action Commission's Child Care Programs from 1990 to 1999. She is perhaps most widely recognized for her lengthy political career, serving three terms as, on the Northampton City Council and six terms as Mayor of the City of Northampton from January 2000 to September 2011. Um, Claire, this is, it's all yours now. And I welcome you. And again, um, I just am so excited that you're a part of our program right now. Thank you. Hi, everybody. Uh, so before we um, jump in, I wanna share my screen and just share a quote that I think is a really, it really says what I want to talk about today. So let's see if this will work. Um, this is a quote from uh, Hubert Humphrey that says, the moral test of government is, um, is, oh, sorry, I'm trying to get rid of the, your, I had to hide you guys so I could read the quote. The moral test of government is how, how government treats those who are in the dawn of life, the children, those who are in the twilight of life, the elderly, and those that are in the shadows of life, the sick, the needy, and the handicapped. Now, the reason I wanted to talk about that, I'm using that to frame what we're talking about, is because I think COVID has exposed all of the fault lines in those areas, every single one of those fault lines. When we think about um, children and what's happening with kids right now. When we think about the elderly and the tragedy of, of what's happened in nursing homes with, with elderly folks and the isolation of, of elderly, and I'm including myself in that group. And, and when we think about people who are living with disabilities and, and the challenges that COVID has, has posed, it, it, it began me thinking about how we have to rethink care. And there's some folks on 
I think Barbara Black, I saw her face on here and there's some others. We've been talking about the challenges of, of children in the age of COVID. And so I wanna start there, right? So kids who, um, um, you know, we live in a, a society where um, the, the parents are trying to piece together how to take care of their kids as COVID has gone on, right? Um, we run child care centers that are open. Um, well, let me back up. Um, the economic downturn has hit families, um, especially hard in already disadvantaged communities. So as you know, um, it's been had a tip, particularly deep impact on children, uh, women and children, and, and particularly on um, households that are headed by Black, Black and Latino uh, people, and especially Black and Latino women. More than half of the Massachusetts households with children have lost income since March. More than half of, of these households have lost maybe not all of their income, but some of their income. Um, and about two thirds of Black and Latino households have lost income since mid-March. So what are their options? You know, they, they've opened unemployment claims. 45,000 um, claims were opened just in a single week in October in, in the Commonwealth. Now, I don't know if people know what's going on with the unemployment system, but some people are waiting as long as 10 weeks or more to get their unemployment because there's been a lot of scamming going on and the system is all backed up. And so people are, they, well, they may have applied, they're not actually getting it. Close to one out of six households with children are reporting that they might not be able to pay their rent or their mortgage in the next month. And for black, again, for black and Latino families, it's twice that amount. She said she gets um, people aren't buying food. Uh, uh, about one in 10 households say that the kids aren't eating enough. So, and that's in a state where um, the, we, Massachusetts has about 20 people that are billionaires. If there is one on this screen, I'll think the odds are low, but if you could identify yourself so the rest of us can send you fundraising letters, I'd appreciate it. Um, that was a joke. I don't know if it was funny, but I tried. Um, collectively, those 20 billionaires, wealth has raised by about $17 billion since mid-March because of where the money is flowing during the pandemic. You may remember the um, almost gone president bags about, brags about how great the stock market has been doing since he's since his presidency. Billionaires are doing okay. And co some corporations are recording record profits while downtown businesses and small businesses and home, home run businesses are, are falling to pieces. So then, I, you know, then I'm thinking about who does the caregiving? Who does the caregiving during this time when we're in this crisis? Many low wage workers are, are not only having to care for children, but also care for elderly while there is no, um, while there's very little support for them outside the home. Um, the uh, child care system is in shambles in the state. Um, significant numbers of child care programs are closed right here in Northampton. Sunnyside closed after 40 years of being in operation. Family child care providers are closing. And child care is, um, is, in addition, already very expensive in Massachusetts to begin with. We have the second highest child care costs in the country. Um, and the child care system employment mirrors the system, the people who are employed in other caregiving professions, women. Women who are low wage workers who often have children of their own. Uh, and they, so all of those challenges exist there, right? So, um, a few boring facts. Did you know that the average cost of infant care in Massachusetts is, is $20,000 a year? Uh, a four-year-old's close to 15,000 uh, on average across the state. So, and so what we've seen during the pandemic is child care system has contracted for a number of reasons, including the fact that um, you can't have as many children in the classroom because of COVID. Programs have not been able to make enough money to stay open. We're open because we have a state subsidy. If we didn't have a state subsidy, we wouldn't be open. 
Um, the purely private child care systems are, are, are providers are the ones that are closing. Um, and workers are getting sick and maybe not being able to come to work. You're seeing that mirrored on the elder care side, right? That there's that uh, elder uh, um, home care and, and nursing homes are struggling to keep staff or to, or to find people to work. And this it's on the caregiving side that we're seeing this challenge. And uh, as, a, you know, as Hubert Humphrey says, also the people who are living with disabilities and that, that, that sector of the economy, the, the group homes and the, those folks. That, I have a friend who works for ServiceNet who says they're struggling to keep people employed, right? To keep staffing uh, on a 24 seven basis. So and then it brings me to the public schools. The public, so in the United States, we do have a universal child care system. We call it the public schools. Right, your kid turns five, and you don't pay for full day care anymore. You send your kid to the public school, then you piece care around that day, uh, before and after, and over the summer you find um, day camp or whatever you can put together. That's closed now. So many of those low wage workers have um, are struggling now to just piece together any care so that they can go to work. Now, so I'm not gonna talk a real long time. Linda told me I should talk for half an hour. I, I was a preschool teacher. I don't think people's attention spans are that long. So uh, I'm not gonna talk for a full half hour, but I, I kind of wanna talk a little bit now about, um, about the fact that, you know, because the schools are closed or, or on these very difficult schedules, it's made it really hard for people to go to work. And because people are unable to go to work, we have a whole other set of challenges that have been created. Now we're in a we're in a recession, we're in a COVID-related recession. All the other major industrial countries have responded by sending people checks in the mail, without having a giant fight with a guy on the golf course. Right? They've just sent the checks. We've had to have a giant fight to get even a little bit of money into people's pockets. So, because we haven't done that, now we have a, a, a eviction crisis. We have a crisis of people not being able to buy food. We have a crisis. We have a cascading crisis, right? If we had sent people checks and essential workers have been prioritized for care, people who worked in nursing homes and people who worked with um, people with disabilities and child care workers have been prioritized as essential workers and paid a little bit more money since they have some of the lowest wage work in the economy. Maybe we could have weathered this a little bit better. Um, but here we are. We didn't do any of those things. So right now, um, you know, we're all waiting for the vaccine. Child care workers are not prioritized in the first group as, for vaccine. They're prioritized in the second group with, with uh, teachers, with school teachers, except that school teachers, by and large, aren't actually in the building with children which, when child care workers are in the building with children. Not, not entirely. There are some schools that are open. So... So where does this all come from? So then I start thinking about, well, why is this? Why is it that we have this crisis of care? You know, what's that all, what's that all about? And it's really about the fact that the, all this work we're talking about, caring for people, with, caring for young children, caring with people with disabilities, caring for the elderly, was all unpaid work done by women before women started moving into the workforce Women have always been in the workforce, don't get me wrong, but women, uh, uh, many, many more women work moving into the workforce in the 70s and 80s. And that work, which used to be unpaid or done by, or done by very low wage workers is now, there's a much higher need for that kind of caregiving, right? Families don't keep the mother in, home, in the home for, you know, people don't keep their parent at home anymore. They, we have assisted living. We have places that people go if they're elderly. We don't, thank God, we don't have places like Belchertown State School anymore. We have people living in the community, right? But all that work has to be paid for. And it's not, that kind of work is, uh, we don't have, we haven't figured that into the economic equation about how we're gonna pay for it. Now, if we believed that it, it had some economic value, would we pay for it? Probably not. I would be surprised if we did. And I'd be curious what people think about this, but, um, it used to be unpaid, and unpaid work isn't counted into our gross domestic product. You know, our, our gross domestic product. It's not counted as as real work. It doesn't result in money in people's pockets. And so, when you bring that into the paid workforce, it's still 
is it really counted as real work? And all the people that have tried to commodify it, right, the, the uh, chain child care programs that have gone under, all of this stuff, it, it doesn't really make you th that much money because you can't, person can't pay for it out of their wages, right? So, so finally, and then let's, let's start having a conversation. Really the, my challenge is how do we, how do we move some of these things from uh, a, a commodified market piece of the market into what we call a public good where the public chips in together to pay for these costs and make sure that it's done in the way that it needs to be done. And that's the piece that I think I'm hoping with this new administration we start talking about. Like what are the real public goods that make us a healthy society? Because then it comes back to what do we know that is good for kids, right? It's not good for kids to be in four different child care settings a day. It's not good for people to be homeless and then be moving from, from home to home. The odds of a child who, who grew up um, um, unstably housed becoming homeless as an adult are very high. It's not good for, it's not good or productive for our economy to have people with disabilities segregated off and not getting the kind of engagement in the community that we know that we can have. And, None of us who are getting older want to be shuffled to the side and not be able to be full participants and not have when have the kind of care that we need, right? So how do we make that all a public good? It has to be done through a political process. So we know at the federal level, at least on the child care side, that presidents, uh, the incoming president is looking at that, right? How do we make child care at least affordable to people by having it not cost more than 7% of someone's income. That's the, the, the goal in the childcare world. How do we deal with elder care? How do we deal with that in a way that doesn't break the bank of a family or an individual? Those, these are the kind of challenging questions that we should be talking about instead of, well, I, I think, we're, I don't know about the rest, rest of you, but I'm still kind of in shock about the episode the day before yesterday. And, thinking about, is that what we're gonna be talking about now? I really wanna talk about how we make a difference in the lives of people, not this kind of dystopian um, a view of the United States. So I'm interested in, in working together with people to, to make these public goods, right? To make it into a, into a public good. So in, in Massachusetts, we've got, a, oh, there's a coalition working together to introduce a bill in the legislature to think about how to, create uh, an early education subsidy so that nobody does pay more than 7% of their income. It's gonna be extremely expensive. And that then begs the next question, are we, are we willing to pay that price now so that we build the kind of society we want the next generation to live in? And we're a short-term short thinker, so sometimes we're not willing to do that. But that's the kind of conversation I think we need to be having moving forward. Um, Anyway, I'll stop there. Uh, and I hope that was somewhat kind of coherent. And if you were booing, I can't tell because I you were all muted anyway. Um, I don't see any chats, but I think that I, I would personally like to, like um, we have 50 people and I think most of the people are on the screen. Um, if people would have any comments, um, uh, you know, instead of, reading a chat, um, I, I would love to have a dialogue on this subject because I think it needs to be discussed. I think personally, you know, we've, we've heard about the teachers. We, we hear about the, the, um, the, 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 the lack of food for everybody and, you know, and it's touching our heartstrings. We never really hear about the, the, the babies. We never hear about the, the, the youngest children in our, uh, our society, in our community. Um, and it, it's got to be incredibly difficult for those families trying to bring up um, the toddlers now in not getting the support that they need. Um, does anyone have any comments that just raise your hand and I can see it and we can open you up. Right, Nina? Is, all right. Don't leave me hanging. Yeah, I know. Come on, you guys. Barbara I, Black's got her hand up. Oh, okay, I don't see her. Barbara, can you um, unmute and um, share your thoughts? She's Did unmuting. Did okay. I unmute? Yes. Okay. I mean, I, I, 
only I could only say, you know, uh, Claire and I have had this conversation too, too many times. And, and um, but I think that the point, Claire, that you're making about that, it's not, I mean, it, you know, clearly those of us that have been in the early childhood world are very invested in that, but it really is very similar for the elder care and the care of people with disabilities. And we need to, I don't know, someone suggested, you know, there should be like, you know, department of caring, um, which cuts across education and, and um, homeless, you know, housing and food and health and it, all of those things. I mean, I think it just is, um, it's, it's, I mean, for those lucky enough to have grandchildren, we're watching, you know, them struggle or, you know, our children or our grandchildren struggle with not being able to go to school or be in childcare. But it's also, I think, you know, Claire, what you're saying about, you know, about what's the, the public good. I mean, that we really need to be looking at those things and all of it across the whole um, life span spectrum. So, yeah. yeah. It's kind of interesting to think about the um, the um, idea of of a department of caring, right? Um, and 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 the idea of public goods. Like we before some of you got on, we were talking about the water pipe and the sewer pipe in Pomeroy Terrace. That was kind of a revolutionary idea to do sewage, but it was a public health mechanism, right? To make sure that people were healthy. Maybe we need to be thinking about caring as a part of a public health, a public, you know, sort of an additional part of the public health backbone, making sure everybody's care, you know, it, it is a part of that whole public good, right? We measured, we measure um, our investments on a year to year basis without, which out, without thinking about, like if I help pay for this child's childcare when you're, you know, birth to five, that investment is gonna have, is gonna pay off for, for generations, right? And we know that with public health that there's a, a huge preventive cost savings, right? So anyway, and there is in Bhutan, they have what's called the, uh, they do a, a, a something called a measurement of the, of the, of the gross national happiness. And they look at, at, at how people are doing. <laughs> How's everybody doing? And I, I kind of like that. That is cool. Yeah. Uh, we do have um, a, a one person who's um, put something in the chat and it's from Dorothy Barr. And she said, thank you for, for a very important presentation. What can we actually do? I think you're, you we're going, you, you started that conversation now. Um, can you give us some strategies? I'm really concerned about the childcare issue. So, uh, yeah, I can. I, mean, I think first off, um, I, I, we are gonna have a president that's gonna put forth the childcare bill, right? And Elizabeth Warren put forth the childcare bill when she was running. And I think everybody's sort of circling around a childcare bill that begins to think about the cost of childcare being somewhere around 7% of people's income with subsidies for the lowest income. I think we have to really push all our, both our federal and state representatives to be supportive of that. Um, and that's just doing what we're doing now, but doing it 9,000% better, right? Massively increasing the supply and thinking about it for the lowest income. There are ways to think about doing a subsidy for the lowest income and trying then through either a mix of subsidy or tax um, credits, making sure that people don't end up spending more than 7%. And um, so I think that's important. The revolutionary thing that I think we have to start talking about, and I'm not sure that we're gonna be able to do it right now, is to really um, think about this dichotomy we have between education and care and try to break down that wall. Anybody who's had kids in school knows that it's childcare. Because when they're not in school, you're taking care of them. So. Right, it, it, it is both education and it's childcare, right? And, um, and early childhood, uh, childcare is, is early childhood education. It's also education, right? But really the act of care is, is part of how we learn and grow, right? We grow and learn in places that we feel safe and cared for. So we have to really, I think, generally stop letting people talk about and well, stop letting them encourage people to think more broadly about the ideas of care and education as, as inexorably intertwined and not separate concepts. 
Um, as anyone else, does anyone, thank you. Those are all really good points. Um, I just have to make a comment about, you know, with, with the COVID uh, experience that we're living through right now. Um, and it, what, what I find is bringing our neighborhood together, even though we're socially isolated. Um, but I, I have a quick story. The other day, my husband was raking leaves, well, before, before snow. And the two twin boys from next door came over with their, their, their um, rakes. This wasn't happening um, before COVID. You know, we were nice and we were friendly, but now we've almost formed a, a family. And um, I, I, you know, I just really reach out to everyone and just tell them that, you know, they can start thinking um, into their neighborhoods again and reforming that. Very, very similar to what we're doing right now with Northampton Neighbors. Um, we're, we're trying very hard to bring people together and to provide the support they need um, in areas of even dementia, where previously people immediately went into um, long-term care facilities um, when they were experiencing um, memory loss. And now we're trying to create a, a, a supportive um, experience where um, they can live at home a little bit longer and their carers would also get support. So I'm, I'm saying we might have to just rethink everything. Rethink our, um, you know, how we interact with neighbors. It used to be cool. We should, could, could bring that back again. Um, you know. I think Jean, who's had her hand up? And oh, then Jean, somebody, <laughs> And somebody has a comment in the, in the chat after that. Okay, good, thank you. Jean. So, so Claire, um, how do you think that we make um, mostly men um, in power understand that birth to like eight is really vital years and the people who are involved with those years as professionals aren't just babysitters? <laughs> Yeah, you know who's been the biggest, who was the biggest supporter of, re, of higher investment in early education and care in the Commonwealth was um, Bob D'Elia, Speaker of the House. Mm. We're actually worried that he's leaving because he did such a good job for us in the budget for the last five years. And it was really a, a question of telling him the story from both from an individual family point of view and from a larger public, public, um, uh, you know, sort of, what's best for kids birth to five point of view and really tie together education and care for them. And within, even, it. even within school districts. Right. You know, it, it, the, the years when people take SATs are the years that are really, right. really important. And it's all, you know, I, I mean, I don't have to tell you, but I, um, yeah. I, I, I remember having this stark realization that when I was a child care teacher, that the size of my check was commensurate with the size of the person I was teaching. Like if I was teaching college students, I would get a much taller check than I was getting when I was teaching a two-year-old. Right. And, and so I agree with you that it's a lo much longer conversation, but you know, there's a group of military people and I'll, I'll make common cause with anybody if it works, who are some of the biggest, it's called Ready Nation. And they're some of the biggest advocates for investment in early education and care. Because the time when executive function happens, when we learn how to say no to a, a bad idea is actually birth to five. And I remember when I supervised teachers, I would say to them, look, you, these kids are all gonna know red and blue by the time they're 16, but they might not know that they shouldn't punch Johnny in the face if they don't like what he said. Right. The, the teachers, birth to five teachers are really installing breaks, right? <laughs> Installing an ability to 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 restrain um, um, impulse and to and to think through the action in, in some very deep ways, and they do that by caring. They do that by connecting emotionally with the kid. Kids only do that if they have an emotional connection with adults that are caring for them. So if they're in childcare settings or early education settings where they have three teachers a year they're not getting emotionally strong connections with those other with those adults and that that kind of thing doesn't happen so that's why these army people are supportive of higher investment because they see the value 
of this kind of um, social emotional regulation um, as being the highest thing that, that we really need in people. Mm -hmm. The ability to delay gratification, the ability to, to be empathetic, all those things happen first of all. Does that make sense, Jean? Oh, I mean, you know, you're preaching to convert. Can I also add in? Sure, Barbara, go ahead. Okay, so just that I think that we have to weave all the pieces together, both you know, sort of the, the, the pieces about uh, self-regulation, executive functioning and, and brain development, but also the economic pieces for the grown-ups and I and you know the reality is for a long time we've depended you know we've funded childcare only based on the need of the parents and that's not functional but I think given what we've seen in the last 10 months it, we really just have to keep hammering on that education is care and care is education and that they're not uh, you know, Claire, as you said, this dichotomy. And, you know, so I think that we have to sort of be attacking on multiple, multiple levels, multi-pronged, whatever you want to say. But, um, you know, we want to talk about it from the perspective of families, what they need, and of kids, what they're getting. Um, and that, um, and, that it, and that it is that, you know, the develop, brain development as well as the care, child care piece um, is as important for, you know, the birth to eight as it is for birth to five, as it is for five to 18 or 20 or whatever it is. Um, just, we have to just put the pieces together. And I think, you know, go back to quoting um, Heckman who won the Nobel prize for economics, it's showing that the return on investment is massive um, if you support high quality early education and care. It's what is, you know, something between seven to one or 13 to one return on investment, which is better than you get in just about anything else. So there's a couple of things in this chat. Should I mention them? Thanks, Barbara. Yeah, yeah go ahead. We're so, ready. So there's some discussion about the, some work the, the uh, mayor up here in Greenfield, which is, which is where I'm sitting right now, by the way, um, is um, doing a sort of during COVID sort of pulling together, working with the schools and with seniors and really thinking about um, supporting families through some really creative ideas. And it might be interesting to have her on to talk to you at some point about the work that she's doing. Um, she's, the, she's doing a really, she's doing a very good job. She's done a very, you know, done really good work up here. Um, and then um, some discussion about food insecurity. And I would just note that um, we have the best advocate in the country in terms of food insecurity and Jim McGovern, our Congressman. And if you're concerned about food insecurity, he's the person to be connecting with. And the fact that he is now the chair of the rules committee at the, at the, uh, in Congress uh, gives me such um, hope in terms of um, food be con continuing to be at, you know, it will be at a high level because he's there advocating for it. Community action as a part of our work does um, um, run two food pantries. And um, we are seeing people come in who haven't come to food pantries before, but they're coming now because they need the food. And we're also doing deliveries because there's some people who can't get out to get the food. So we've hired people to go out and do deliveries of food. It's been a really important part of the work that we've done since uh, the COVID shutdown. We also floated volunteers to the um, Northampton Survival Center, some of our staff who, who couldn't work on site, we uh, floated them to the um, pantry both here, both in Northampton and in Amherst for a bit to, to support. And then there's one other note here um, about the ACES score. And I'm gonna just put something in the, in the chat about ACES, which is um, average child experience score. And it looks at the ch experiences that you have as a child. But the thing is, if we have kids in care, even high risk kids who have who who are on the path to having high ACEs scores, I, I went to a workshop with a woman who talked about these adverse childhood experiences and well, what do we do about it with kids now? We we run high quality programs to help counteract 
what could be an, a, 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 um, a, um, a lead into a high, high ACEs score. Do you understand what I'm saying? Like we, the time to intervene is now, not to go back and try to retrofit after someone's had some adverse childhood experiences, right? And, um, and so we've, in, for instance, in our classrooms, we're now doing um, um, touch points work, which is where we're doing pretty deep work with parents and with kids in terms of connecting um, with families and giving them the kind of, giving both kids and parents the kind of support they need to continue even after they leave our programs, you know, supporting their kid. Myrna also makes a really important point and I'm hoping, I, I, I think I was trying to say it, but this is really, I mean, she's, you're absolutely right um, that the fact that um, when you advocate for a public good, you're seen as a socialist basically, as I think, is that a fair shorthand for what you're saying there, Myrna? I, I think that, you know, you're talking about healthcare here, but it's true for everything, right? You say it, everything's promoted as, as, as a public good is, is socialism, except for the ones that we've accepted for a really long time. Like sewer and water is not, so, is not considered socialism. Having the fire department to come to your house is not considered socialism. But it is a, a, we all took our money, threw it in a common pot and decided to spend it on the people that, as they needed it, right? Isn't, is that socialism? So we have to counteract these things on a really regular basis. Public schools, are they socialism? Yep. You know, I guess maybe, did my parents think they were socialism when they sent me to parochial school or did they just you may want to make sure that I got into heaven, which I, I think I'm probably not going to, but, um, you know, I mean, there's, it, we underinvest in those things, uh, but there are some things that we're willing to say, okay, they, they are public goods. Public schools started in this, in this state, right? In the early 1800s. So how long did it take to become sort of a universal public good? A pretty long time. And the interesting thing about early, early education is that um, that grew out of, it's only been kind of in the news and important to the, to the government. A, when we're in a war and they need people to go fight the war effort, right? World War II being that example. And B, when we're trying to Americanize immigrants or to clean up people who we think, you know, to clean up the acts of people we think are not doing well, like intervening in people who are, with people who are on welfare, for instance. Um, and not as sort of a generalized public good. And then when you think about people who are with disabilities who had been institutionalized, they only won the right to live in the community by going to court and fighting for it. Their families went to court and fought for that right, for them to live in community. Anyway. Uh, there's, there's, a, there's another one that we missed. Uh, you, um, and this is from Naomi and she was asking, you are focusing on childcare, which is wonderful. Um, what do you think about paid family leaves? Oh, you know, I talked about childcare, but I actually think what we need is, um, is um, um, we need a, a, a family policy in the country. We need to, to look at things right from paid family leave to paid leave to care for an elder. For, to, um, uh, and we're moving towards some of that, but it's not good enough, right? Right now, under the new parent paid family leave in Massachusetts, somebody can take up to close to a half a year to, to parent a new child. It doesn't mean, and, and it, they're going to get they're going to get some money for it through, through the paid family leave um, fund that's been set up. We're not there yet, but we should be continuing to work on issues like paid family leave. We have to think about. Um, um, what the parameters of all that are and how do we build it in such a way that small businesses can also make it work. And that's a, and that's a challenge, but it doesn't mean it's an un, unmanageable challenge. Again, 20 billionaires in the state. Okay. <laughs> so, uh, right, we have an unequal distribution of resources and we need to think about that, right? How do we, how do we make that happen for all the people that need it? You know, I, you know, I heard Richie Neal speak once and he was talking about you know, he's, he's not the liberal darling of everybody, but he does talk pretty powerfully about another public good, social security, and about how before social security and, and Medicare, um, your parent lived, you know, the grandparent lived in the home and the family paid for those medical bills. 
and 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 the advent of things like Medicare made a huge difference. He lost his parents early. The fact of the Social Security survivor benefits allowed his family to continue um, it, it, without going broke with additional, you know, his whoever took him in. So it just it's interesting to think about those things. Um, um, And, and uh, somebody's asking about this. Um, um, well, first of all, somebody's recommending a book called Viking Economics, which I'm going to go look at. But uh, the states, um, Stan wanted to know about the state's response during and help during the pandemic. I have to say, the state has been pretty darn good. So we um, we we got money for uh, child care. They worked hard to try to figure out how to keep the child care centers open and sort of. St staying right on the edge of the child care regulations from because we it's mostly federal money so that we can continue to spend it to keep the publicly funded child care uh, programs open so they were flexible as flexible as they possibly could be the biggest investment they've just put in is the money that's going towards eviction prevention so you know there was a moratorium they lifted the moratorium now um Lots of folks are scrambling to help keep people stay in apartments, but they put a, a significant sum of money into that. And an additional money now should be coming from the federal government to help backstop that money to prevent evictions. You know, in other countries it, where they just sent people checks, they were able to continue to pay their rent. That would have made a lot more sense, but we didn't take that path, right? Okay. Um, so I would say, um, It's been interesting just to think about the how hard it has been to do business with government during the pandemic. I can't tell you how many times I get something from the government that they want to send us money to give out to people, but I have to sign 15 paper copies and mail them to them and come, you know, it just like we're still in like, I don't know what year, but, you know, and actually the feds have been better in terms of just getting us the money and figuring out the paperwork uh, electronically. The state government still is sort of mired in, you know, in something. And actually, and the other thing is not all parts of the state government are mired in it. Some of them are like, well, just send you this thing and just send us, a, sign this Adobe document, we're all good. Some other ones are, can you sign this in triplicate and send it, you know, overnight mail and, it, you know, and I think, okay, am I in the Wayback Machine? But sure. I, I, it, you're going to send me a hundred thousand dollars. I'll do whatever you want, and then we get the money out to uh, whatever it is that we need to do. Joe Comerford, for instance, got a great grant program, which was a nightmare to get the paperwork in, but it was a great grant program that allowed us to buy a refrigerated van for a pantry. We never had one. Now we can get the refrigerated van and 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 go to the food bank. Food then get the food and bring it back to the pantry, and we can bring more back because before we just had a small van. So, and she also allowed us to hire, it also gave us a couple of, uh, oh, we're doing an online, we're, we're going to be setting up an online ordering system for our pantry. So, I don't know if that's helpful, but that was the kind of stuff that the state has been doing. Really interesting, fill in the, the gap kinds of stuff for, and some smaller programs, and then the big eviction for prevention. And um, the other thing is that fuel, the one place I'm a little bit worried about is fuel assistance where the number that we got this year is probably gonna be a little down from last year. And we're hoping that number goes back up with some, a next round of CARES Act. So, um, you know, uh, somebody's asking about how the dialogue gets started between the factions of the country. You know, I read a really interesting, anybody see the in interview with Reverend Barber in the New York Times Magazine, I think it was last week, where he just said, start giving people health care and start getting them real wages they can live on. And whether they're left or right, they're going to feel better about government. Like if you take care of their kids' health, they're going to feel better about it. You know, Obamacare was at under 50% when it started. It's well over 50% now. It's a popular program even for the people who want government out of their life. Obamacare is a popular program. And Social Security, which you know, was seen as socialism when it started, is an extremely popular program now. Medicare, AMA came out against Medicare. That was gonna be the end of med Western medicine as we knew it, right? Extremely popular. So I think we just have to go about the business of creating the public goods and moving forward to make sure that those public goods are supported over time.
Thank you. Do we have any more questions or comments? I'm looking at the little heads. <laughs> there's a comment from David. And there's a waving hand from Chris. Oh, okay. Well, let's take Chris first and then we'll go to David's question. Hi, well, I, <clears throat> some of you know, I just retired after 20 years as an infant toddler teacher at Foothill. And I'm hoping as we move forward to, um, to expanding the role of early childhood that we try for, to have a age and gender diverse workforce. Um, I think it very much benefits kids to see all kinds of people and that we stop disparaging the care aspect of um, early education and care. Um, when people think of care, they tend to, it seems they tend to think of changing the diapers and serving the snacks, but just spending time with, with kids as people is very important part of that. So I hope that that, as we move forward, I hope that's what, something that will happen. David, you're reminding me of the, I, I directed, a, I was a director of a center in Amherst um, and um, we had a, four classrooms and uh, half the teachers were men and half the teachers were women in that, in that building. And it made a huge difference for kids to have that many wow. men in faculty. It was great. And we made a men at daycare calendar, which was mm. kind of fun too. Yeah. <laughs> um, and, I, and I just wanted one other comment, changing diapers and feeding kids and helping kids feed themselves is education. Yep. It is education. Mm -hmm. The care and, and education are inextricably linked, and we have to stop separating them. And I'm so glad you said that. Couldn't agree more. Yeah. Um, Somebody wants to know where we can start writing postcards. Well, you know, um, I think the next set of uh, things that we need to be watching are on the budget side uh, at the federal level and on the state level. So we're going into a budget. The new state budget is being written right now. The governor will be submitting a budget um, probably um, sometimes toward the end of the month. And, uh, and I think it's gonna be important for people to keep their eye out for that budget. Um, there are some people who, uh, so there's a group called um, Strategies for Children in Massachusetts that keeps track of the budget. You can get on their mailing list and they can give you information about what's going on there. Yeah. Right here in Northampton, um, well, and the food bank, if you care about food, the Western Mass Food Bank is a good, um, a good uh, conduit for what's going on in the food uh, and the hunger, fighting hunger world. Uh, I will say that the food bank gets the food, it, the food bank is the grocery store for the pantries and the pantries still have to go get the food. So I'm gonna say, if you care about food, also support your local pantry because uh, they, there still is that last mile. You have to get the food from the warehouse to the store. So um, if, you, if you care about um, people with disabilities, there are so many good organizations in our region that are doing some work. One of the ones that I'm, um, you know, uh, Pathlight, who does a lot of work with um, young people, is a, a particular favorite of mine, but I think there are others. And, um, and in terms of senior, there's, I mean, you are the powerhouse, right? I'm looking around the screen. This is the powerhouse for thinking about what is next that's important in senior, in senior advocacy. And I know Linda keeps a hand in that um, and understands what's going on a bit. So, there may be some issues in the budget, especially in the federal budget that people want to keep an eye on. Uh, the ones I know best are the early education ones. So, I, and I know in the upcoming year, we're all going to be working towards a bill that makes early education and care moves it more towards a common good over time. And so keep your eyes tuned there. And the, one of the better places to get information on that is strategies for children. And I just say, we've also got to be willing to pay more in taxes. Absolutely. Absolutely. So on, this, on, the, on that side of the ledger, thanks for bringing that up. So there's a group called Mass, uh, the Mass Budget and Policy Center, and um, they're sort of the progressive voice for taxation and for, for spending in the Commonwealth. They um, proposed, along with a lot of other people, the so-called millionaire's tax a couple of years ago that the Supreme Judicial Court said couldn't go on the ballot. It may be on the ballot next year. 
And that would bring significant new resources into the Commonwealth for transportation and education if it passes. And it would be a, so, you know, we live in a weird country, right? Where everybody, everybody thinks they're going to be a millionaire. And I'm saying this generally, I'm not saying everybody, but there's this idea that, well, I could be a millionaire. So I'm not sure I want to tax the rich because I could be rich and then I'd be screwing myself. So maybe I won't tax the rich. Well, you know what? We're not going to be rich. So it, but it, in a weird way, this bill recognizes that and tax the million and first dollar that you make. Your first million dollars are on the house. You pay the regular tax rate. Your taxes only go up if you make a million and a million and one dollar and up. Okay, and that's going on. To, it, I hope it's going to be on the ballot next year. Um, it it went through the process, you know, where we all do petitions and we get it through, and then it went to the Supreme Just Judicial Court, and they decided it could not be voted on by petition. So the legislators are now voting to put it on the ballot, and they can put it on the ballot. And then we should vote on it because it's worth a significant amount of money. And on the federal level, we are now going into the time where we have a democratically controlled administration. And they're yet again coming in to clean up a Republican deficit mess. And, and the people who are the deficit fi fighters, right, are always the one that jack up the deficit. And the people who are the tax and spenders are always the ones who have to clean it up. So we're, we're, and I'm hoping that the Democrats don't just say, oh, we have to cut because we have to clean up this deficit. I'm hoping they're understanding that we have to spend money if we want to make our country secure and safe. And not secure and safe in the public safety way, in the emotional caring way. Any, any other thoughts or questions? Um, I'd like to just maybe just take one or two more and then maybe just have a, a just a little bit of a, a, a sort of the um, advertisement, you know, that we usually do once we um, get to the questions and answers, which I did. We have not followed the same pattern and I'm sure I'm going to hear that from my speaker series um, committee, but um, this worked because- you What happens when you ask an anarchist? No, I don't know. I, I'm I, <laughs> I, I can remember sitting with you in a panel in Lithuania, Claire, you know, and, and you were able to answer what was the, uh, the problems with uh, corruption in government for the Lithuanian government. You can talk about anything. I know that. That's no yeah. problem at all. Um, what I, I, I just think that this was um, an opening. I think we need to open our eyes to this. I think we've been for the last year, we've been living in our little isolated houses and watching MSNBC from morning till night and, you know, keeping focus toward the, um, you know, just the political scene. But what we need to know what's after that political scene and we're, re we're, we're beginning to open our doors now. And I think that your presentation was so important and I still feel very strongly, my heart says, you know, we have to think of the babies. We really do have to think of the babies and the families. Um, the other thing I, we, we always do this advertisement of that Northampton Neighbors is a private nonprofit. We are one of the few villages in the country and the world that do not ask for a membership fee. So please go to northamptonneighbors.com and check out if you want to make a donation, it's always wel welcome. Um, Next week, we have next, not next week, but um, January 22nd, we have our next speaker is Mark Peterson, and he's going to be presenting Taking Charge of You and Your Life Planning. So that'll be com completely different from this, this wonderful eye-opening experiences about youth and family. Um, does anyone else have any more questions? Uh, and you know, again, thank you, my friend. You're that's the way that's the way um, Rachel Mantle always had answers. Thank you, my friend Chris. You know, and so now I'm I'm going to be able to play Rachel Mantle for two seconds in my life. My dream come true. Um, I, I just really want to thank you for again opening that door because we need to we need to see what's really happening. We we do need to take. Um, some involvement in this. And I think David presented a really interesting point in his questions, where in his uh, comments is that, you know, a lot of people have been putting a lot of time and energy into 
trying to take back our country, literally. And now these wonderful people have this their, their energy to put toward other things. And I think that you've given us some new directions to go in. Um, I so probably I, should do a short plug for the Retired Senior Volunteer Program if you don't already know about it, because uh, now my agency runs it, so. Oh, I know that. Yes. Other story, yeah. Yeah. Oh, sure. If you, if you really are interested in, in um, learning more about the RSVP program, um, please check it out on the, the website. Good work. Yeah. Thank you. Congrat I, I had that hat for 18 years, and it's dear to my heart. So when, when Linda and I met, uh, she was the director of RSVP, so yeah. Good, good luck. Any other organizations or any other um, programs you want to take over, Claire? <laughs> yeah. No. No. Oh my God, oh, you're so good to, to really to open that umbrella and keep expanding that umbrella. They need you. Uh, hi, somebody's got their hand up. Oh, good. Hi. Really hi. Is this, I don't know if it's me. I hope it's me as I'm, I'm speaking. Oh, thank you. Okay. Yeah, thank you so much. It just, I just, we just this week launched the pandemic delivery service, which is yeah. now, uh, it, for, if you live in Northampton and you're over 65 with an underlying health condition, we'll deliver the library materials that you put on hold. It's an expansion of our home delivery service. So I just wanted to give a little plug. We'll be doing some more publicity for it, but you can, if you go to ForbesLibrary.org, it's right on the homepage. So take advantage of that if it would be helpful. That's thank great. you. Sorry, I sorry to just seem. Oh no! Thank you. Thank welcome. You. Thank you so much, Lisa. Thank you for the good work you're doing during this this trying time too, Lisa. Um. Okay. If there if there's not any more or, uh, any more comments or questions, I think maybe we could say goodbye until two weeks from now. Thank you from Thanks. the bottom. Thanks for having me. Thank you. Sure.